everyone. Welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast for our Week 13 Waiver Wire Show. I'm Bobby Sylvester with Mike Taglier, as always. How was your Thanksgiving weekend, Tags? It was good, man. Uh, it was good. I know yours was pretty hectic trying to get into the move and all that fun stuff, but uh, yeah, it was it was a real good weekend for me uh, being a Julio Jones fan. Uh, he's my, my favorite player to watch in the game, and just to see him kind of go off, it, it just made me smile. It, it made my week. Let's just be honest about that, because there was nothing, there wasn't much else on this slate that was too, excited, too exciting in the NFL. I mean, it was just a, overall a bad week for fantasy football, I think. It was amazing what he put together, and you called it. This is the second time that you've now called a uh, a wide receiver to go for two touchdowns and 150 yards and you nailed it both times so i'll be looking forward to your pick this week i'm just gonna do that (laughs) yeah i'm gonna have to look through that i haven't gotten through all the games yet obviously we're just we're on monday but uh i've started going through the slate i haven't found my bold prediction yet but uh hopefully i can keep that up man because uh it definitely helped me in dfs this week yeah yeah you're right I, i did do a lot of packing this week we're moving out further into the country if you can believe it this weekend um but i saw the crabtree and talib fight i've got a fairly strong take on this one tag so i want to hear yours first (laughs) <laughs> that Michael Crabtree doesn't know how to fight. <laughs> that, that was my takeaway is like, you're going, I mean, like he's throwing punches off balance. Like you're a football player, dude, stick to football. Akib Tlaib, he, he got a good shot in there, but Akib Tlaib was smart. He at least kept his helmet on. Like <laughs> it was, uh, I don't know the football NFL players trying to turn UFC doesn't really do it for me. Uh, it's, it's more embarrassing for the sport. I was just the, the big takeaway for me from that game was Amari Cooper. I was really worried for him when he, when he took that hit, uh, and he went down. He was officially unconscious. Like you just saw his head drift off into oblivion. And uh, I hope he's OK. Yeah, seriously. I hope he's not gone too long either. I hope he comes back and performs just as well, uh, maybe even better. You know, I was chatting with our boss this morning and I think he hit it right on the money. They're all just big losers fighting like little teenage boys on national television. Like, give me a break. But I come down pretty strong on Crabtree's side. Like if someone rips your gold chain twice I mean, you could file a police report for that. So we blocked him really hard all the way out of bounds to embarrass Tlaib. That's fine. 15 yard penalty. I'm fine with that. Yeah. yeah. Seven Broncos attacked him, ripped his helmet off. Then Tlaib's throwing a haymaker while Tlaib's helmet is on. I think the NFL needs to come down really hard on this punk. Suspend him like three games. Crabtree shouldn't even get a single game. I mean, yeah, he threw punches, but he's defending himself against a psychopath. Like uh, if you didn't see it, the, the Raiders owner had him up in the suite after that. As far as I'm concerned, they may have won this game because Tlaib was off the field. I think he's a lot more important than Crabtree. Yeah, I would agree that he's more important than Crabtree. Uh, and yes, Tlaib definitely deserves a lot of hate in that. Um, he was smarter about it in the way he went about it, I guess. Uh, but yeah, no, no, it was it was very thuggish to what he did. And to know that he ripped off his chain, when I saw that happen, because we knew it happened last year, if you are if you missed that whole entire thing, uh, Michael Crabtree got his chain ripped off last year by Aqib Tlaib during the game, like on purpose, like he snatched his chain and he was touting him about it and all that. And obviously he did the same thing again. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm just tired of the fight in the NFL like guys it's it's, yes. a, it's a very it's a, I, I get it your adrenaline's going and so many people have come to me on Twitter saying that you know Mike you've you never played the game and this and that and I'm like stop it stop it seriously I'm a grown man I understand how emotions can get the best of you sometimes but to sit there and let it go on as long as that did it was really uncalled for and you know to throw punches like you did Michael Crabtree you just you just made yourself look like an idiot yeah I mean I'm cool with the block out of bounds though like I that's what oh, I yeah do. I was like I, thought I, that I was would sp- try to humiliate the guy after he does something like for that. sure that's exactly what I would have done like um, that that in that moment, that frustration is going to get the best of you. And yes, I probably would have done the same exact thing he did. I have no issue with what he did there. It's what I did afterwards yeah. with your helmet yeah. off going after a guy with his helmet on. It's just stupidity. And he was protecting himself, man. I don't know. And anyway, tags, there were injuries galore this weekend. The biggest of which you talked about Amari Cooper and Doug Martin's concussions. Do you think they're going to be out for a while? Uh, Amari Cooper, I hope not. I mean, concussions, that's the thing. They're they're really fickle. Like, they can last multiple weeks just because someone's had a history with them. They could be, you know, back within three days like Devontae Adams was after his big hit that landed him in the hospital. So, I mean... Amari Cooper doesn't have a history of concussions, so I would assume that there's nothing more to look into there. He's just got to go through the league protocol. They don't play until Sunday, so that is fine there. I mean, we can't speculate as to whether or not they would. It's just going through the protocol, but uh, neither player, as far as I'm aware, has a history of concussions. So um, I would assume that both of them make it back. The biggest, the biggest news for me is that it seems like Jimmy Garoppolo is going to get a start in Week 13, and I'm... I'm intrigued because he's playing against the Bears. I mean, are you excited about that? Are, are you even going to have him in your top 15 quarterbacks? 
Like, even if he was against the worst opponent, he doesn't know the playbook. He's got nobody to pass to. Yeah, well, I, I did see the final few snaps of that game. Um, Garoppolo looked actually pretty comfortable in his three snaps that he did play. Um, yeah, and Goodwin's not a number one option, but the Bears... Kyle Fuller is their number one cornerback. Like they've really struggled with with number one receivers who are getting targeted a lot. And Marquise yeah. Goodwin, surprisingly, this is a stat I found, and I know he's this is the waiver wire show, so this is gonna come up because we wanted to talk about Marquise Goodwin. But um this year, did you know that over in four of his last six games, Marquise Goodwin has totaled sixty eight yards or more, including three eighty yard games. So I mean, like he's putting up numbers, even though it's not necessarily pretty. Uh and Carlos Hyde is seeing 13 targets in a game. Did you know that Carlos Hyde saw 13 targets this week? I'm not surprised at all, man. That's what he does now. But yeah, I, I did know the stat about Goodwin. I actually wrote about it last week because he's just been on fire. And it's not that he's getting so many receptions. It's just when he does get a reception, he goes crazy with them because he's super fast. So I think he's startable in the flex most weeks because he's going to, at this rate, he's hitting like 70% of his starts. <laughs> yeah, or of his targets. Yeah, no, he's that's what I'm saying. I'm rooting for that guy, too. So that's cool. But that, I mean, it's yeah, I, I think Garoppolo is going to start. And also, we got the announcement right before. I don't know if you saw it, uh, but that Trevor Simeon is going to be starting for the Broncos again. And that's that's kind of big news, because I mean, if you haven't paid attention to the schedule for the Denver Broncos, it's a really good one. I mean, honestly, it's to the point where Trevor Simeon is going to be streamer worthy, like you can consider him. Uh, they're playing against the Dolphins this week. Uh, they're going to be playing against the Jets, then the Colts, and then the Redskins. So the, this, the way that the schedule lines up, Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, Trevor Simeon, they have a chance to kind of like show up when you would least expect them to. I think that makes sense. I mean, we've seen Simeon play good football before, and at this point, he's playing for his career. If he plays really well, he might have a job in the NFL next year. If he doesn't, he's probably never starting a football game again. Yeah, I think he's going to. I think that we're to the point now like where I think Simeon's definitely backup worthy. I don't think that somebody's going to want them as their starter. Uh, but the Dolphins, this is a chance for him to look really good because that's more news that dropped today is that William Hayes, their defensive end for the Dolphins, he's like the best player on their defense, maybe outside of Dominican Sue. But Hayes has been really good, like under the radar. Uh, he's out for the year, uh, according to Adam Gase. So that's another blow to this Dolphins defense that has been torched as of late and it seems like the Broncos run game has just nothing going for him uh, that they're not run blocking at all so uh Trevor Simeon someone that I'm paying attention to as we go into week interesting 13. yeah uh, Mike Williams is injured I think he's droppable at this point he's got mm -hmm. all kinds of upside but I, I don't think he's going to play the rest of the season they're just yep. going to take their time with him a few third tier quarterbacks are hurt Teron Armstead this could be a really big one for Saints fantasy players he's their left tackle great pass blocker He's injured. We'll see what happens with that. But the one I want to talk about is Greg Olson. Is he going to be shut down now? Has to be. I mean, I don't know if he's going to be shut down, but I think he's going to miss at least a week or two because it, it sounds like something similar to what happened with Sammy Watkins, what happened with Julian Edelman. If you missed the Ian Rappaport tweet, so Greg Olson thought he rebroke his foot. That's what he thought happened when he felt it. They did x-rays and everything was okay. It came back that it was negative and, you know, they're like, you're just dealing with some scar tissue breaking up. Apparently, Julian Edelman felt the same thing when he when he with his foot and it caused him to miss some time. Sammy Watkins was extremely ineffective playing through his, so they decided to shut him down for a while. I think we're starting to learn as the years go on. Like if we have a wide receiver going into next year that, you know, you find out that he's got a foot injury like Jordan Reed thinking about this, uh, a foot injury, an ankle injury or something like that. That's that's caused them to miss time or have surgery on. You need to be extremely cautious and almost fade them entirely in terms of what you're expecting out of them. Greg Olson. I was looking forward to seeing him back because it seemed it seemed like he was ready a couple weeks ago. But coming back and having this, yeah, I'm done. I would rather stream the tight end position than than depend on him going forward. I was looking forward to having him back because he's supposed to save my fantasy season. I mean, I'm starting Austin Hooper every week, sitting here waiting for <laughs> Greg Olson. Now he's not even going to play. Yeah, I feel bad about that Austin Hooper thing. Every single time, it, it's like him and Hunter Henry this year. Every single time that I come around to finally trust those guys, they do nothing but let me down. Like Hunter Henry, I have faith in his yeah. talent. There's just so many targets. But Austin Hooper, even though he's getting a lot of targets, you know, he's getting like five plus targets in seemingly every game. Every other game, it's just like a big letdown where he scores three points, zero points, negative points last week against the Seahawks. So, it, yeah, it's it's ugly at the tight end position, but Greg Olson, he, he leaves you the risk of scoring one point and then being pulled from the game. So, yeah, I definitely look to move on. Hooper and Henry have both had like big time troll seasons. Yeah. A couple other players like that, Rex Burkhead, like every single time that you think he's finally going to stop playing well, 
he scores two touchdowns. And every time that you think, oh, well, he's start worthy now. He gets like two points. And uh, <laughs> another guy like that is um, Derek Henry's been like that. Duke Johnson's been like that. Uh, there's just so many players that like every single time you think you can trust them, you can't. It's annoying, man. Ultimate troll move. I do want to say that Rex Burkhead, if you are out there and you're listening to this show and Rex Burkhead is somehow on your waiver wire, if you still have trades available in your league, because I know there's some leagues that don't operate with a trade deadline, I'm trusting Rex Burkhead going forward. He's in my buy column this week for those who are still playing with trade deadlines. Uh, and it's because even though he fumbled back in week 12, it, but Belichick did put him back in the game. Obviously, we're 13. This was a big telling point. It's like, okay, is Belichick going to trust him? He's going to make him inactive. There's so many questions about it. And then the game happens and Rex Burkhead is all of a sudden the goal line running back. He scores two touchdowns like he's averaged 12 touches per game over the last four games. It seems like that's not going away. As long as Mike Gillisley is inactive, I am trusting Rex Burkhead as an, a flex play at worst. He plays in the league's best offense. He is involved in the passing game and the rushing game. There, there's just nothing. There's nothing there that scares me anymore. James White, his snaps have faded with the return with the emergence of Rex Burkhead. Burkhead, again, that fumble was really telling. That means the Bill Belichick trusts the guy. I mean, he 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 accepted it as a one-time thing. So Burkhead is someone I'm buying in fantasy leagues right now, if you're able to, and someone I would trust going forward. You know, since you trust him, that means he's definitely getting just one point next week. That's probably going to happen. I'm gonna I'm gonna look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Before we jump into our top waiver wire pickups tags, I want to remind you all at home that we're giving away an upgrade to the Hall of Fame package for an entire year on Fantasy Pros. That's our best upgrade that we give away, all the goodies, and all you have to do to enter the sweepstakes is review and subscribe us on iTunes, then take a screenshot and send it to us at contest at fantasypros.com. We're going to draw a name next week, so make sure to get your entries in. Okay, Tags, who's your top guy at under 50% ownership this week? My top guy, I mean, it's it's really tough because it, it all comes down to team, like your roster and basically who you're trying to, like who you need. It's, it's a time of need, but I mean, Corey Coleman is somehow owned in less than 40% of leagues, which I, I still don't understand. He's a wide receiver that's getting tons and tons of targets. Now, the concern is that, by the way, we should have mentioned this right at the top of the show. It's Josh Gordon week. Like... This is this is Josh Gordon week. I'm declaring that it, it's it's one happy week. Josh Gordon week. Yes, we can all get excited for, and I just can't wait to see him back in the football field. I think we're all rooting for him. Uh, but Corey Coleman, his target ceiling, will it go down with Josh Gordon back in the field? I mean, we've seen wide receivers go to new places. We've seen wide receivers, you know, trying to learn new systems. Josh Gordon is coming back after not playing for multiple years. He's coming back to play with a quarterback that he's never played with before. It, there's just so many things surrounding this return that that lead me to think uh, Corey, Corey Coleman should still see a lot of targets. I, I don't think that they go away. Uh, he may have a limited ceiling on those targets. Maybe he's capped at, you know, eight to nine targets and that's fine. But knowing he's still available, even though he's performed the way he has, Corey Coleman's still my number one. Yeah, he's my number one as well. I'd spend my entire fab on him. I mean, you're not going to find eight targets per game, which is what he's averaged through four games. You're not going to find that anywhere on the waiver wire, let alone someone with as much talent as Coleman. Now, granted, Gordon is coming back, so it might drop to six or seven, but the same still applies. So I can't believe he's still available in so many leagues. And keep in mind, he just went up against Cincinnati and Jacksonville. Now he's coming into an easier part of his schedule where he gets uh, the Chargers and Green Bay Packers. I don't know who Casey Hayward's going to be on. Um, so maybe it's not a great week for Corey Coleman, but if he's not on Corey Coleman, Coleman could have a huge week against the Chargers and then the Packers in week 14 to start your playoffs. It's not going to get much better than that. He's going to be a top 20 wide receiver that week. That's the way I thought about it. I started looking at the schedule to think like, okay, if this happens with Josh Gordon, how do we feel about week 14? Then I was like, well, how do we feel about Corey Coleman? And all those questions started coming through and it, it kind of added up to, is Deshaun Kaiser going to be like a legit thing in the fantasy players and the playoffs? I mean, that's kind of where the fantasy season has led to this year. There's been so many off the wall things. I mean, Alex Smith starting out looking like an MVP through the first eight, nine weeks. And then all of a sudden he's kind of fallen off and he looks like Alex Smith of, you know, back when he was with the 49ers where he just wasn't looking very good, like a bust uh, as a number one pick. I, I don't know what's going on this season. Trevor Simeon started the year looking like, you know, he th I think he threw seven touchdowns in the first two weeks, uh, and then he was benched later in the year. There's so many weird things that it wouldn't surprise me to see Deshaun Kaiser kind of emerge as someone you want to start in the fantasy playoffs, especially when uh, Gr Green Bay, I mean... That's, that's going to be so hard not to like Corey Coleman and Josh Gordon in that game. And if you like both those receivers, it's it's going to be hard not to like Kaiser. So 
Um, yeah, Coleman's definitely an add. I think the others you could put in that conversation. Kaiser's hurt, by the way. I mean, he's got he's dealing with a concussion, so we might see Cody Kessler. Well, he so Kaiser left the game with a possible concussion, and then he returned to the game. So he, they they didn't diagnose him with a concussion, as far as I know, because like they, like I said, they were examining him for one, but then they they let him go back in the game and then he scored like a rushing touchdown. Like it was, uh, so he, he'll be back. He should be fine for this game. Um, but other wide receivers in this territory that I think everybody should consider, um, it really comes down to what your team needs, right? Like, let's say that you've lost receivers and you're just looking for someone to play every week. Corey Coleman's atop that list. Zay Jones is interesting, uh, because he's seeing a lot of targets. He's seen at least seven targets in each of his last three games. He still, here's the stat I have on Zay Jones that I wanted to share in the podcast. It's something I came across while doing the primer. There have been 113 wide receivers who have seen at least 20 targets this year. Jones ranks 110th among them with (laughs) 4.4 yards per target. Now, what that means, he would have to see 23 targets in order for him to hit 100 yards on average. That's ridiculous. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, he had 10 targets this past week. He only had 33 yards. Now, yes, one of them was a touchdown. So when you're getting that many targets, it's hard not to produce. So he's in there. D.D. Westbrook, 10 targets this week. I mean, the Jaguars, what are you doing? Like, why are you why are you letting Blake Bortles ruin your season? Um, and then you have Marquise Goodwin, who I mentioned. He's been seeing more targets. And Dontrell Inman, who has seen more than 20% of the targets since, Trubis- since him and Trubisky connected. So while it's not the greatest situation with all of these players, they're all wide receivers who are seeing consistent targets and can at least give you a consistent floor going into the playoffs. And I think that when I speak about all these players, I think they all offer a ceiling too. Coleman obviously has big play potential. Zay Jones has been scoring more touchdowns. D.D. Westbrook can blow the top off any defense. Marquise Goodwin, same thing. Dontrell Inman, the Bears don't really have a red zone threat. So I think that he's definitely got touchdown upside. He hasn't scored yet, but he's getting his yardage. Um, so those are players that I think belong in one territory where it's like if you're looking for a, a starter every week, those are the guys that you should look at. But there's a whole nother category of wide receivers that I'm sure Bobby and I will talk about here that yeah. are like bench stashes. This, these are like guys who are one injury away from being legitimate every week starters. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious how much you would spend on these guys. though. Like Coleman, I would spend everything. And my second wide receiver is D.D. Westbrook. And I wasn't very high on Westbrook because I think he, I thought Keelan Cole was better. It's apparent that the Jags are planning on using Westbrook a ton. You watch him play. This boy is a serious, serious athlete. Like he can get up. He's really fast. He's uh, quick and agile. He's got the whole package. He has really good hands. He's just a small dude. So uh, we'll see what Westbrook can do, but he's about to get a big opportunity. So Westbrook, I'd spend probably 12 fab bucks on. I'd spend it all on Coleman. Yeah, Coleman's definitely someone that I would spend it all on if he's still available in your league. But Westbrook for me, so here's the here's the worry for me, is that once Alan Hearns comes back, it seems like I don't know if Keelan Cole is going to go back to playing outside or if they're going to keep. I, I don't know what they're going to do if and when Alan Hearns returns. I mean, it seems like it's possible that Hearns returns this week. We haven't heard too much on the injury. So that's the concern, right? Because if he returns and if Westbrook goes back to number four on the depth chart to a team that wasn't throwing a lot to begin with. That's the concern. Uh, But again, he's one of those like he saw 10 targets, like obviously Blake Bortles and him like each other. So as long as Alan Hearns is out, then yes, I feel like Westbrook is definitely at least in consideration for wide receiver four territory every single week. Um, Again, Zay Jones. Easiest rest of the season schedule for the Jags on a pass offense, though. Indianapolis, uh, Richard Shermanless, Seattle Seahawks, Houston, San Francisco, Tennessee. With how much they gave the ball to Westbrook last week, I can't see him fading out of this offense. Well, Marquise Lee. So that's the thing is so another player that, again, if he's on your waiver wire for whatever reason, or if you're in a league that still allows trades, Marquise Lee, go out and trade for him right now. Bobby just mentioned the rest of their schedule. He's someone who this week, the reason Westbrook got so many targets is because Patrick Peterson was glued to Marquise Lee. And it's never a smart thing to to throw in his coverage. I want to say Lee only saw two targets. That's not going to happen going forward. Uh, Lee's still the number one receiver in this passing game. That's who Bortles has the most success when throwing to. So while I do like Westbrook, not not as much as Lee. And I don't I just don't think that there's two receivers in this offense who can maybe produce consistently. Um, That's my concern. Yeah, I don't think Westbrook is a start every week, which is why I'm surprised you said uh, Zay Jones and Marquise Goodwin and Dontrell Inman are. I think Goodwin's probably the closest to it, but I just don't think his upside for the rest of the season is that extreme compared to Westbrook. Like I could see Westbrook going bonkers. 
I couldn't see that for Goodwin. I can, I can see him getting three targets every game, sometimes going for 80 yards, sometimes going for 20 yards. You know what I mean? Yeah. But Westbrook, he could become a guy who gets seven, eight, nine targets every single game. And he's a possession receiver that can also break a big play. I don't think that's the thing is with me. I don't think he's a type of receiver that should be seeing nine targets a game. Uh, he To me, he's more of the field stretcher like a Deshaun Jackson. Like Deshaun Jackson's not built to get eight to 10 targets a game. That's just, if you do that, you're gonna, it's not a, it's not a winning strategy. Like you, you use him in certain ways. And if the Jaguars were smart, they, that's what they would do. Um, but in regards to Marquise Goodwin, these are the wide receivers like Westbrook, Goodwin, Zay Jones. They're not an injury away from fantasy irrelevance. They're about as relevant as they're going to be. Like I, I, yeah. even if something happened to Marquise Lee, I don't know if, if DD Westbrook receives a m- massive bump. If something happens to Aldrick Robinson, nothing happens with Marquise Goodwin, uh, Zay Jones. If something happens to Jordan Matthews, it doesn't change his outlook where the receivers that I'm talking about who are one injury away, those are the guys like Kenny Galladay, Josh Reynolds. I mean, Josh Reynolds, we already kind of saw it this week. <laughs> Jared Goff, it was funny. I was listening to Greg Cosell. He, he does a matchup show on ESPN. He's a really smart man. So I, he talks about a lot of real football. He doesn't talk about fantasy football, but he started talking about Jared Goff. And, and the reason that Robert Woods has been so successful is because when Goff goes through his progressions, he basically looks to Robert Woods first. He goes to Cooper Cup second. And then by the time he gets into his third progression, he's got pressure and he's dumping it off to Gurley. That's why Sammy Watkins hasn't seen so many targets. It's the way that they're using him in the offense, what number progression he is. Now, with Robert Woods out of the lineup, potentially for a couple weeks, maybe even the rest of the season, Josh Reynolds, they're expecting him to step into that role. He scored a touchdown and he should have had actually two. There was one that they just missed on later in the game. So Josh Reynolds had a really good game and he's someone that's probably available. And again, this is not, maybe he falls in the category of picking up now if you need a starter because Robert Woods is slated to be out the next couple weeks. So um, yeah, but Corderell Patterson, he's someone else that uh, an injury away where, you know, if Amari Cooper misses this week, if Michael Crabtree is all of a sudden suspended, Corderell Patterson becomes the number one option in that offense. And that's 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 something that people wanted coming out of college. So it's possible that, you know, you were just like six years too early. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I like Seth Roberts as much as Patterson, though. Like, is there really much of a difference between the two, except that Derek Carr throws the ball a lot to Seth Roberts in the red zone. Well, I think it just comes down to the type of athlete they are. I think Cordero Patterson's just a much better athlete. And he's also, it's kind of been under the radar, but he's been seeing a consistent three, four targets a game, even with Crabtree and Cooper in the lineup. So it seems like they've been transitioning away from Seth, Seth Roberts and more to Cordero Patterson. I, I mean, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if that's a real thing, but Patterson would be forced to play on the, on the perimeter if Amari Cooper were to miss. So, uh, it's something to pay attention to, but again, those are the guys you don't have to spend money on in fab. You could just grab if you have a, if you're just looking for an upside play on your bench. Yeah. And those are all the wide receivers I have as well. Tags. Uh, let's go on to running backs here in a second, but first I want to take a step away and talk about today's sponsor. So I've been telling you about my Lisa mattress lately, and I'm really into comfort items when it comes to Christmas. Like I have everything I need, but I feel guilty buying stuff. That's really comfortable. So last Christmas, I got this killer pillow this year. I got my Lisa mattress, which is incredible. It really just is the most incredible bed I've ever slept on. And this year, I just asked for some really nice sheets for Christmas. It's like the perfect trifecta. And I may never get out of bed if this bed actually gets any better. I'm going to start recording my podcast from the Lisa probably. It really is the most comfortable bed I've ever slept on. And America agrees because Lisa was the fastest growing e-realtor in 2015 because they found out how comfortable the mattresses were, told their friends, told their family. And you can try it for yourself because they offer everyone 100 nights risk-free and with free shipping. And we've got a promo code for you. If you want to save $100 off your mattress order, just go to lisa.com slash fantasy pros. That's lisa, L-E-E-S-A dot com slash fantasy pros for $100 off your mattress order. Okay, Tag, so over at running back, it looks like the Seahawks are actually going to use Eddie Lacy in a featured back role. I still don't want him. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I don't really either, but I mean, he's the top option, right? No, he's not for me. Um, this is the point in the year where it's like, you know, if there's a running back that's on the waiver wire, he's on the wa- waiver wire for a reason. Eddie Lacy belongs on waiver wires. I would never trust him in in my lineup ever. Um, it's very possible that y- he has an afternoon game, you put him in your lineup, and then all of a sudden the Seahawks decide he's inactive. That That's a possibility, and you never... Ever, ever, ever want to do that with running backs? I would much rather at this time of the year take some bench stashes like upside. You know, Bobby and I have talked about it throughout the year, but this is the time. 
This is the time where you go out there and you get the best handcuffs in football. I'm talking about James Conner. I'm talking about Charkandrick West, um, guys like that. Those are the ones, you know, typically when we talk about it, we want to talk about offenses who are top 10 in the NFL for scoring. Malcolm Brown was someone, but he's been hurt, so I don't know how much appeal he has. Um, but you're looking for backup running backs. The Saints, they don't have one. They just have two studs. <laughs> um, the Steelers, though, a team that's starting to score a whole lot more points. James Conner would much rather have him. Charkandrick West, obviously, if something happened to Kareem Hunt, I'm not worried about it. Like the thing is, we've seen Charkandrick West be an RB one in this offense before when he was trusted, uh, and that that's definitely possible. He contributes in the passing game as well. There's not much to dislike there. I would also rather have Marlon Mack than Eddie Lacy. Like I just don't like it. I don't like Lacy. I don't like the Seahawks backfield, and I've I've said this all year. Um, there was one week where I wanted to trust Eddie Lacy, and he got hurt in the first quarter. Um, and he looked pretty good that week he did like now that he's healthy and they're giving him 17 carries like you're telling me you wouldn't want that guy's warm body no because like the thing is is even though he had the 17 carries nothing came from it from a fantasy perspective and it was in the best matchup he could ask for against the 49ers you're never going to have a better chance for him to put to have potential and on top of that Mike Davis was inactive for this game Mike Davis is the one who got the start over Eddie Lacy when he was healthy he didn't he didn't look bad that game he played so it's very possible he comes back and Lacy just goes back to the goal line role or whatever they're trusting him in I would much rather have some upside stashes I that but Rod Smith is still my number one Ed I, he's still there uh, we saw him get more touches this past week we saw him get goal line work over Alfred Morris this is a cow- yeah. Cowboys team that is talking about le- legitimately just changing everything they're talking about changing up the cornerbacks the way they do they're talking about changing up defensive linemen uh, how they get how they get rushed on the passer their offense has been a major problem in terms of players are now uh basically complaining about the fact that Jason Garrett, they're complaining behind closed doors that Jason Garrett is not adjusting the play calling. I think this all comes down to, again, what we talked about last week. And I I went on a rant on my Sunday morning show about how Alfred Morris just doesn't work. He does not work in this offense that Des Bryant is all you have. And you need someone out of the backfield who can catch passes because this offense doesn't work with Alfred Morris. It does not work. Dak Prescott is going through a slump. The only way to, to change that is give him some confidence building passes, get him some dump offs to either Cole Beasley to Rod Smith. There's just so many things that I could talk about, but Rod Smith is still that guy. If the Cowboys, so if the Cowboys trusted him, let's say this week they announce Rod Smith is our starter and that's kind of it going forward. He's a three down back. He's a guy that can get it done in all three downs. Is he an RB one for the rest of the season? Possibly. I mean, if Alfred Morris goes away, but like they're still going to be splitting carries, even if Rod Smith is the top guy, right? That's the thing is like they've been splitting carries and hasn't been working. The Cowboys offense has never been one to share carries like that's just never been the way they've been designed. Uh, They don't want to to sub players in and out of the field. They come too predictable. And that was the nice part. It's just I I just think Rod Smith offers them so much more options and that's why I mean I'm just thinking rational coaching here if I'm the if I'm the coach of the Cowboys if you're changing up everything you need to go to Rod Smith and see what you have keep him on the field and let's see how we roll and I, I promise that it would it would turn out a lot better um, than it has the last couple of weeks because Alfred Morris I mean he's been fine on first and second down but the offense has been predictable and defenses have been able to shadow Des Bryant in coverage they've been able to just shade coverage his way if they want to there's just no other threat in this team. And the Redskins, I mean, you have to get it done with the run game. You have to. And you need a running back that can get it done. That's the thing. There's I, I've talked about this so much, so it's just hard to to harp on anymore. But Rod Smith yeah. is is right in that conversation with James Conner and Charkandrick West. But Smith actually has flex appeal as soon as this week. That's fair. Yeah. I don't think he's going to ever get 20, 25 carries in a game like James Conner could. I don't think the offense is as good. I don't think the offensive line is as good. I don't know if Rod Smith's as talented as James Conner. If you've watched him run, I think he could be a very good running back in this league. And Trekendrick West, I mean, he's just attached to Andy Reid. So I have both of those guys higher than Rod Smith. I'd spend maybe three bucks on Rod Smith. I'll tell you what, if I was the Cowboys coach, I'd give Carlos Williams a call and see if he's still eating a bunch of Cheetos <laughs> or if he's in good shape because Carlos Williams could have been a really good running back. But he just lost his opportunity. Well, I don't know why they. <laughs> this, this is another he blew thing. his like, opportunity. I don't know why Darren McFadden was on this team if you were literally going to cut him. Like he never even had. Well, a they chance cut to him play. so that he could have an opportunity somewhere else. But that, I know they said that, but he could have an opportunity with the Cowboys. The Cowboys need someone like him. Like he was someone that actually should have had the job over Rod Smith to begin with. But I know that they like Rod Smith, and why not go to Smith? I, I'd prefer Smith or McFadden over Morris in the backfield, and I. 
I just don't understand it. This is a team that needs a running back like McFadden, yet they refuse to play him. I, I don't get it. Meanwhile, Darren McFadden led the league in, in rushing yards while he was the starter a few years back. Remember that? Just two years ago with the same offense. And he didn't score it. Like he scored, I think, like three touchdowns that year. Like it was, yeah. it was ridiculous. And that was a team that like had major problems at quarterback. They had major problems at wide receiver because Des Bryant was out for the year. There was no options in the team. And yet he was able to run the ball well. Like none of it makes sense. None of it. So I'm spending $6 on Eddie Lacy just because you can't beat 15 to 20 touches. I don't know if that's going to keep happening, but there's a chance it does. And if it does, I would like to have him on my team as a, you know, as a fourth running back in case one of my guys gets injured. Um, I'm spending like three bucks on James Conner, Charkandrick West, Rod Smith, as I mentioned. How much are you spending on these guys' tags? Rod Smith, I mean, if he's back on your waiver wire, because someone picked him up at some point, they probably dropped him. Uh, he's a guy that I think you only have to spend maybe five bucks, because the thing is, people did see him score a touchdown Thanksgiving, so they might throw a couple bucks out there just to say, no, why not? Uh, James Conner is the type of guy where if he's not on a roster right now, you don't have to spend more than two bucks. You can just spend two dollars, you'll get him on your team. Same with Charkandrick West. Uh, Marlon Mack is available in it looks, like, it looks like he's available in 75% of leagues. He's not really a, a massive upside guy. He's like the type of guy, like if you're looking for a desperation flex player that you just need to toss in your lineup, he's, I guess, a guy. But the Colts coming out of their bye week didn't go to him. So it, that's, for for me, it just says that they're never going to go away from Frank Gore this season. It's not going to happen. Well, what if Frank Gore gets hurt? What does Marlon Mack become? I mean, I... <sighs> But I, I would I would say Marlon Mack is an RB2 if Frank Gore goes down, because then you're going to see him yeah. getting 15 plus touches a game. The talent's there. He has the ability to break a big play. Uh, and that's why, for me, I'd rather have Mack than Lacey, because I'm never going to trust Eddie Lacey. Like, I can't. Uh, I mean, and th- on top of that, Eddie Lacey, here's his schedule coming up. He plays against the Eagles. Then the Jags. Yuck. Yeah, those Yuck. two matchups are awful. Then he's going to play the Rams. Okay, that's a good one. Cowboys, they're going to have Sean Lee back by then. And then he plays the Cardinals in Week 17, which we don't really care about. Uh, but that's what I'm saying is that his schedule is not very good. And I just I don't trust the Seahawks run game at all. So uh, I, I would rather have Rod Smith, James Conner, Charkandrick West, and Marlon Mack in that order over Lacey. And that's the best part is you only have to spend like two bucks to get any of them, maybe barring Rod Smith. You know, here's the thing about Marlon Mack, too. Like if Frank Gore was to get hurt, which it never happens because it's Frank Gore, right. but if he was to get hurt, I would expect Marlon Mack to be an RB2 and there's a chance he could be an RB1 and maybe a good RB1. Like Marlon Mack has a ton of upside. He does. I mean, that's the thing is I w- the reason that I wanted to see Marlon Mack out of the bye. I felt like the Colts needed to find out what they have in Marlon Mack before before going into next year without addressing the position because Frank Gore's done. Like he's he's out after this year. Uh, that's what's going to happen. The passing schedule for the Colts is brutal down the stretch, so they're going to need to use their running backs a little bit, especially in the passing game. So there was so much. Uh, the, the Colts organization, we obviously know they're, they're not the best run. There's a lot of people frustrated with them after the way they handled the Andrew Luck situation. So this is just another thing to add into that, that they just never used Marlon Mack. So, I mean, even if he went down, who knows? Maybe they add Darren McFadden because they think they have a hope, they have hope in the playoffs. Or, I don't know. It's it's just you know, ugly. Brissett's been competent enough that I'm almost wondering if the Colts are going to try to trade Andrew Luck. No. Just free Andrew Luck from this organization, please. I mean, I could see why he'd want out after hearing some of the things that Ursay said, um, but I don't they'd be stupid to trade Andrew Luck. Like you, you, you spend all this time searching for a quarterback like him. And um, I mean, I hope the arm, the shoulder thing is uh, it turns out to be OK. But I mean, there's questions about it for, for sure. But I remember the same questions being said about Peyton Manning from his neck surgeries. And then he tr- he came back, obviously, after the Colts <laughs> let him go passes or whatever. Yep, yeah, <laughs> broke the record. So, I mean, I, I think Andrew Luck's going to be just fine. I think this is all I think that they've just handled it poorly. I hope so. Yeah, so Tags, are there any other running backs on your radar? I've got uh, Jaquiz Rogers, who if Doug Martin is out for a while, I think Rogers is the go-to guy there. We've seen him do it before. Um, and then Peyton Barber, I don't want to play him, but he's going to get goal line carries and enough work that I think you could flex him if Doug Martin's out. Yeah, I'd much rather grab like TJ Yeldon, where if something happened to Leonard Fournette, at least we know Yeldon would come in, get the passing down work. He'd be mixed in on first and second down. But again, this is the point in the year where I'm not interested in in Jaquiz Rogers or Peyton Barber, just because they're players who I'm never going to trust in my lineup, especially in the fantasy playoffs. Even if they had a start, they play behind a bad offensive line in Tampa Bay. Uh, Doug Martin hasn't been able to get anything going. There's a reason they've stuck with him this long uh again Yeldon seems to have 
outpaced Chris Ivory, and it seems like he's the clear handcuff to Leonard Fournette. So it's just you, you search for those running backs who are the clear-cut handcuffs, the guys who would have involvement in all three downs if they were to take over, and that's why, you know, mentioning those other guys. Those are the guys you want to stash in your bench. Forget the 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 guys like Frank Gore. Forget the guys like Jaquiz Rogers, Peyton Barber. Those handcuffs don't mean anything anymore. Rogers has been a starter for six games in the past two seasons. In those six games, he's been an RB1 four times. I mean, that's not anything to sneeze at. Nope. Last year. I remember it last year. But that's <laughs> that's the thing is like they obviously don't feel the need to go to him at all. They, they gave him a shot at the beginning of the year. And a lot of people picked up Jaquiz Rogers because they thought he would he'd be a good stopgap for that. Or if Ezekiel Elliott was suspended. I remember a lot of people were worried about Zeke at the beginning of the year. But he didn't even perform in those games very well. Like and they they made it was so oh, easily. He, he was fine, man. 67 yards, 108 yards. And he had 18 and 19 touches right exactly tons of touches and that's the thing they've gone away from that for whatever reason the Bucks Doug Martin's been bad I get it but they've gone away from running the ball a lot even with Ryan Fitzpatrick I thought they'd go back to running the ball 25 times a game easy they haven't so I again I want no part of that run game it's just that's what I'm saying. I stay away from teams like that. Uh, I think it would be a timeshare with Rodgers and Peyton Barber. I think Charles Sims would get involved in the passing downs. Barber gets the goal line work. So, again, none of them are have a clear-cut role, and that's that's serious. That's, this is not what I want in the fantasy playoffs. I'd prefer, again, if someone goes down with an injury, you know that you could just stick another guy in. You know what I mean? Yep. Tags, let's talk tight end, and uh, it is ugly. Like, if you need a tight end, you're in rough shape because Charles Clay, I don't think he can be trusted. He's probably the top pick up there. Ricky Seals Jones, I watched him play this weekend. I'll tell you what, I mean, this is someone who was a former high school phenom. He was a top recruit. Everybody loved him. He got moved to tight end, he didn't perform as well in college. He still has that athletic ability. I think this is a legitimate breakout and not some kind of fluke. I, I mean, I'm not saying that the player isn't. I'm not saying the player's a fluke, but I'm saying the performances will turn out to be a fluke just because. Yes. Yeah. The opportunity, I don't think he's going to be there, but I think he can be a serious player in this league. I think it's possible because Jermaine Gresham is obviously not the guy like he's not a guy that's going to like scare anybody. And um, there's I could see why people want to get excited about it. And he did play more snaps this week because I want to say in, in uh, the week, the prior week, he only played like eight snaps. So people were getting excited over nothing uh, this year. Uh, this week, he got ramped up to I think it was 17 snaps he played. So he's seeing an increase, but it's still not like he's playing a full time role or anything like that. They still have Gresham in there for blocking purposes. Uh, but Seals Jones, he's someone to keep an eye on in Dynasty Leagues, like where if you're in a Dynasty League, sure, Adam, you might have something there. Uh, but for redraft. I would rather pick up Clay or I'd rather have OJ Howard, uh, who who appears to be emerging in this offense, whereas Cameron Braid is being phased out. OJ Howard has always outsnapped Cameron Braid. They were using Howard in as a blocker. But as the year's gone on, once Fitzpatrick took over, they seem to go to Howard a lot more. So it's kind of like a trend developing. And he's obviously got a better quarterback situation than Ricky Seals Jones, which is why I'd probably go Howard. But both of them are just in the streaming conversation. You think Ryan Fitzpatrick's better than Blaine Gabbert? Oh yeah, really? I, I, I don't know, man. Blaine, Blaine Gabbert's fine. I know he looks. I know he looked really good, like in the preseason, and I think he's been competent the last two weeks. So I don't want to take anything away from that. I was the one who said in the pre- he was good against the Jags, man. He had the best game of the season of any quarterback against the Jags. I think you know the term is that someone overlooked a matchup, like someone just took it way too easy. I think the Jaguars, I think they felt like that this was a matchup that they won before they even played it. And I think that they didn't show up. That's what I think happened in this game. There's no reason that they should have lost. I, I would argue that Blake Bortles kind of gave the game away. But he also saved the game for them by rushing for two touchdowns. I mean, he, he was fine besides that disastrous, disastrous <laughs> pass. Yeah, I mean, Bortles is what he is. Um, this team is not yeah. going to win through the, through the offense. They're going to win through their defense. And like I said, I just think it's a defense that just failed to show up for this. And not to say they failed to show up altogether because they made some plays. They they kept them in the game is what they did. Uh, but I don't know. I, 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 I'm I not putting my faith into playing Gabber just yet. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I had more to do with the game plan. They weren't very aggressive. Uh, Arizona's offensive line either performed well or they just... You know, we're not running enough blitzes. It was just ugly. You can't give up 27 points to Blaine Gabbert and expect to win. It's just just horrible. Yeah. It was, yeah. And uh, Telvin Smith was hurt because of Ricky Seals-Jones. <laughs> I, I got nothing. I got nothing here. It, I, like I said, I would not pick up Ricky Seals-Jones. I just want to be I just want to be clear about that. Okay. <laughs> in, 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 in season long leagues, I would not pick him up. I'm just 
being clear because again guys we're, we're we're at the point in the fantasy season where you've gotten so far let you're going to the playoffs right now do you really want to live an entire off season knowing that you depended on a backup tight end that's playing with Blaine Gabbert a backup tight end who's going to Washington third easiest against the tight ends in week 15 and then the Giants in week 16 in your championship game if he continues to improve in snaps if he's getting up there around 35 snaps I'd feel fine starting him in weeks 15 and 16. Are you going to play him over someone like Kyle Rudolph? No, no, of course not. But if you need a tight end, like I'm playing Austin Hooper, I might rather play Ricky Seals Jones in weeks 15 and 16. If we see him ramp up in snaps and playing full time snaps by week 15, 16, then we'll have a conversation. That's that's definitely a conversation. But but playing 17 snaps out of 73 that they had in the game, that's that's not nearly enough for me to feel okay. confident. Uh, you're you're talking sub 25 percent. So, I mean, he needs to get on the field more is basically what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. OK, tags uh, over a quarterback. Again, it's ugly. We've got some guys under 50 percent owned here. Tyrod Taylor, Case Keenum, Eli Manning, Jameis Winston, but he's hurt. Blake Bortles, really good rest of the season schedule. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if you have to pick him up, that just sucks. <laughs> uh, Josh McCown and Jacoby Brissett. Well, Blake Bortles, I hate to say it, but Blake Bortles, he um, he's going to play the Colts this week. The Colts have been atrocious against quarterbacks all season long. I think that Marcus Mariota is going to be like the first quarterback to not finish top 15 against them, which just goes to show how bad uh, Marcus Mariota has been this year. Yeah. Then they play the Seahawks, who have been kind of a shell of what they, they used to be. Then the Texans, the league worst secondary, and then they close it out against the 49ers. So the Jaguars passing game actually has legitimate potential for the fantasy playoffs. And Tyrod Taylor, so... He's someone that is interesting, too, because if you don't need a quarterback for this week, okay, he's playing the Patriots this week. I don't think it's like a a horrible play. I think he's like a high end QB, two. But if you're in in need of a quarterback for weeks 14 and 15 in the weeks one and two of the fantasy playoffs, Tyrod Taylor is someone to snag right now. He's playing the Colts and he's playing the Dolphins. Again, the Dolphins just lost one of their best pass rushers, if not their best pass rusher. The Colts, again, I just mentioned they've been awful against quarterbacks all season and then he plays the Patriots again in week 16 so it's not like the worst matchup where it's like game script in that one you figure they're going to be coming from behind New England plays a lot of man coverage that that's good things for mobile quarterbacks because the defenders often have their backs turned to the passer so that helps so yeah Tyron Taylor is definitely a top my list Uh, if he's on your waiver wire and if you need a quarterback or if you stream quarterbacks you're going to be able to use him for at least two of the next three weeks Agree. Yeah. Uh, Taylor's my favorite as well. And someone that I like more than Bortles, Brett Hundley. He had a really good game against the Steelers, who have a pretty good secondary. Three touchdowns, 245 yards. We know he runs. Next two weeks, he gets Tampa and he gets the Cleveland Browns. So I wouldn't mind starting him in those two weeks. Obviously, I'd prefer to have a Phil Rivers or something if you have the opportunity. <laughs> but uh, if you need to pick someone up, I think Hundley can get the job done the next two weeks. Yeah, Hundley's someone that worries me. I just don't think he's a very good quarterback. And I know that on primetime television, everybody's saying that, oh, the Packers have something in Brett Hundley. I remember hearing the same exact thing after the Bears game, after Brett Hundley threw a touchdown in the fourth quarter to Devontae Adams, and everybody said he had a perfect passer rating. He's he's finally getting it now, and he's this and that. And then the next week, he goes against the Ravens, and wah, wah, wah. All, yeah, yeah, and, the by Ravens. The, and by the way, <laughs> the, the Steelers' pass defense is not all that. Like they've been exposed. And that's the thing. They they started out the year really good, but they were playing bad quarterbacks. And now that uh, opponents like the competition got once the competition got better, you've seen the Steelers start to fade in terms of what they're allowing to passers. Marcus Mariota, he threw four interceptions against them, Mike. Marcus Mariota has been bad. <laughs> that's the thing is if you watch that game, you know that Marcus Mariota, he is to blame for at least three of those interceptions. The other one might be on Corey Davis. Sure. Uh, but yeah, the Steelers defense is, I mean, Jacoby Brissett threw for 222 yards, two touchdowns. Matt Stafford before their bye week threw for 423 yards. He didn't have a touchdown in that game, but it's still, it just goes to show what they're allowing. Mariota still threw for 306 yards on just 33 attempts. So I take Hundley's touchdown like his three touchdowns with a grain of salt because the one to Jamal Williams that was just a screen pass that Jamal Williams took to the house which made up for a lot of the yardage yeah, that Brent Hundley got true. so I just again Hundley I don't think he's a bad play in two quarterback leagues and if you have a, a really good matchup like against the Browns I think he's he's competent enough to get you by I don't think he's going to win you a fantasy championship or anything but um, if you're a streamer he's definitely someone to pay attention to if say Tyrod Taylor or even Blake Bortles might not be available can we all say by the way that Jamal Williams is actually a good football player now. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and uh, <laughs> we talked about that last week. I know, like I know, I know you agree, but it's annoying that everyone's like, "Oh, he's not very good. He's not nowhere near as good as Aaron Jones and Ty Montgomery." Like, no, Jamal Williams is quite good, and if they had an offensive line right now, 
he'd be on on the cusp, and especially if they had Aaron Rodgers, he'd be a top fifteen running back. Oh God! If if Rodgers was a part of this team and Jamal Williams was active and Ty Montgomery was not top five, oh hundred, he'd be in my top ten every week, every single week. Because, yeah, yeah, because like you, you see lighter fronts. The fact that Brett Hundley was playing, and uh, by the way, Jamal Williams just—I know he didn't run for his yards per carry wasn't great or anything, but the Steelers have been really good against the run as of late. But Jamal Williams is is a grinder. He's a workhorse. Like you can give him twenty carries and he's going to be just fine. Ty Montgomery's not that player. Aaron Jones might be. Uh, they they might have a tandem here i have no idea it's going to be a really interesting conversation this offseason when we go into it trying to figure out which running back you want to own in green bay or if there's none of them yeah tags let's talk uh defense special teams really quick i mean there's really if you're streaming there's only one option i think the los angeles chargers should be your number one waiver wire pickup unless Corey coleman's available in your league or one of these guys like josh gordon who snuck under the radar because the chargers get cleveland and if you're streaming t- uh, defenses and you have to go somewhere else, like you might as well just close your eyes and pick one because they're all total crapshoots. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Uh, the Chargers defense is definitely the one that I would want. Uh, their pass rush is so good. Um, Joey Bosa, yeah. he, like he's one of the best pass rushers in the game. If you know, uh, Melvin Ingram's one of the best in the exactly. game. I mean, they're probably two of the top four, right? Yep, they've been pressuring quarterbacks. They've been getting after it. That defense has been underrated. They've gotten better against the run as of late, and the yeah. Browns. You know, we've talked about it. The Browns, uh, they have allowed, I want to say, it is four or more sacks in each of their last four games. And there's been multiple games where they've allowed six or more sacks. So uh, that should be a contest where, yeah, they're going to have Kaiser under a lot of pressure in that game. Yeah, which is uh, not good for someone like Kaiser who makes boneheaded decisions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the Chargers, they're fourth this year in fantasy points. They've been playing really good football. They also have maybe the best cornerback in football in Casey Hayward. Um, and the Cleveland Browns, they're the easiest to go against. So I think it's just a gimme. It, they're close to the Jacksonville Jaguars this week. I would I would put it that way. Yeah, they're they're definitely a good matchup. The Jags are at home against the Colts coming off of a bad week. I expect the Jags to, to show up like big time in this matchup. So I, w- I, I wouldn't obviously take them over them. But if you're in like DFS, I'm sure we'll talk about that on our uh, Thursday show uh, where, you know, just depending on the prices, I haven't looked at DFS prices yet this week, but I'm sure that the Chargers are going to be a lot cheaper than the Jags. Okay, Tag, so let's uh, let's do this segment that we've been doing lately where we talk about players who are owned in a little bit more than 40% of leagues. If they are out there, how much would you spend on a Josh Doxson? Doxson, yeah, he's one to go all in on. He's in that conversation with Corey all Coleman. They're, they're, yeah, they're guys that are being trusted uh, by their quarterbacks. Josh Doxson's had some awful matchups over the last month, month and a half. And he's still posted like respectable numbers despite that. His air yards, his uh, targeted air yards are all there. Kirk Cousins, he's the number one option. If he's a one-on-one, Cousins will throw it up to him. It's an awesome, awesome play. So yeah, he's worth all of it. I actually like him quite a bit more than Corey Coleman if they're both available. Agree. I agree. Because with, with Josh Gordon back, we, we talked about that. It limits Coleman's ceiling a little bit. Tyler Croft, is he a better rest of the season play than uh, Charles Clay? <sighs> Um, I don't know if I would say that. I'd have to look at the schedules to see kind of what each of them have. They're both in the streamer conversation where it's like I have no issue dropping either one of them if I find a better streamer on the waiver wire. Uh, yeah. But if I had to pick one, I mean, knowing the schedule for Tyrod Taylor, it's probably Charles Clay. Yep. Yeah. I think uh, Charles Clay by just a hair. But Croft is in the conversation. Uh, okay. What about Josh Gordon, Corey Davis? How would you compare them to Josh Doxson and Corey Coleman? Those are the upside plays, right? Like Josh Gordon, uh, we obviously talked about it where this week you're not going to want to trust him against uh, against San Diego or San, San Diego, Los Angeles. You're not going to want to trust him against the Chargers. Let's just be clear about that. Uh, but the week after that against the Packers, that's going to be a matchup that we're really going to want to play him if we see him on the field for a lot of snaps. If we see him play 60 plus percent of snaps this week. I'm trusting him against the Packers as a wide receiver three because we know the upside there. We know that the Packers cornerback situation is very weak. Um, so, man, I. But you're trusting Coleman anyway, right? So you probably have Coleman higher than Gordon. It depends, honestly, because Josh Gordon could be like that new toy that Deshaun Kaiser gets. And he's just like, you know what? What's the worst that could happen? I throw it up to this this physical freak who's six foot four and and can dominate cornerbacks. Do I do that or do I throw it to the Coleman who's undersized? But that has done well with the targets I've given him. I think he can go to both. I think both are in similar territory for me. I think Coleman's going to be maybe a little bit safer because he's obviously been in the system. He's played with Kaiser. He's seen the targets. So Coleman just a little bit over Josh Gordon, but it's close. It's really close. I'll tell you what, Tags. In three years, you've got Josh Rosen. David Njoku, Corey Coleman, Josh Gordon, 
this could actually be a really, really fun offense down the road. It's going to be interesting for sure. I mean, I, I definitely want to see who they end up with the quarterback because I don't think that there's any way that they that they continue to go forward with Deshaun Kaiser. I, I just I, ha- yeah. I haven't seen anything there that makes me think he's my franchise quarterback. I've seen a guy that is willing to take shots and they, they, they turn out bad more than they turn out good. He's got some good physical tools, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a franchise quarterback. Yeah, maybe Kirk Cousins goes there so he gets all those toys. Well, it'd be nice if Cousins did there. I mean, at least he'd go somewhere where he's appreciated. Yeah, he'd be the, the savior of the football city. Like, I don't know. It sounds pretty appealing to me. They could just make a trade for Brock Osweiler. Oh, wait. <laughs> All right, Tags. Uh, Martavis Bryant, Cooper Cup. How about those guys? Martavis, the, the, I mean, like, obviously with uh, with Juju out this week, he saw an increased target share. He saw six targets, caught four of them for 40 yards. It was good to see him getting back involved in the offense. He's kind of like that that guy that, if you're in the fantasy playoffs and you know that you have no business being there, that you're playing the number one seed and their team is just ridiculously stacked, that's the type of team you throw in Martavis Bryant and say, let's just hope he yeah, goes for one of those call. big games because it looks like he's getting his confidence back. Ben Roethlisberger seems like he's starting to trust him a little bit more. Obviously, Juju is going to come back and be the number two in that offense, it seems, at this point. But Martavis Maybe he'll still be has back. The- if he's not back, I mean, Martavis could be a top 30 wide receiver every week. Well, right. But that's the thing is they're, they're saying it was a slight hamstring injury and he was practicing on a limited basis. So it seems like I don't think it's a long term thing. They may shut him down for one more week, but he should be back for the fantasy playoffs. Making yeah this a, a, a little bit of a volatile situation but again once you get outside the top 20 receivers a lot of them are volatile yeah i've got brian in the same range as a dd westbrook so i'd spend 10 bucks on him yeah i, I think that's a fair comparison say in the dd westbrook territory i think that's fair better quarterback situation obviously uh but maybe not first in line for targets and then cooper cup with robert woods out you gotta love cup you have to. Uh, he, you could just tell Jared Goff anytime that he feels like he's pressured or that he's under duress. Like Cup is the first one he's going to look to. Uh, he's been a possession receiver. He hasn't had the highest ceiling, but he's one of those guys that you can play almost every week while while Robert Woods is out. Yeah, I would play Cooper Cup for sure every single week that Robert Woods is out. I mean, I know it's not great matchups coming up and everything, but he's just going to get so many targets. He's that guy right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, somebody else who's available in a lot of leagues, Jordan Reed. He was listed as questionable last week, and a lot of people thought he might play. I think it's a pretty good bet that he does play in Week 13, and he's owned in just 63% of leagues, so he's still out there in a lot of your leagues. And if you can grab him, I'll tell you what, he might be the guy that saves you in the fantasy playoffs. Yeah, I mean, if he's available, he's one of those high, high upside bench stashes, especially considering the Redskins lost uh, Chris Thompson. That's huge. They lost Terrell Pryor. I don't know if I want to call it lose Terrell Pryor because he didn't do anything anyways. But yeah, he's definitely one of those guys that you could stash in your bench. I mean, if you if you need someone this week, I wouldn't trust that. I wouldn't want to play him. I'd want to see him play at least one game before I trusted him in my lineup and actually get through that whole game. Uh, But he's one of those guys for sure. Jay Gruden did say um, after the Thanksgiving game, someone asked him when he's going to be back. And he says, I have no idea. Like, basically, I don't that doesn't sound like someone who's close to playing. He apparently went to go see a foot specialist again. I don't know how many foot specialists he's seen this year. Yeah, but It's been a lot. Um, but yeah, he's 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 a high upside bench stash is what he is. And the last guy I want to ask you about tags is Derrick Henry for the Titans. Um, he finally got some more work this week. He's had a troll season too, where every once in a while we think, hey, it looks like he might take over the job. And then all of a sudden he's getting like four touches. So uh, <laughs> Derrick Henry, if he's available in your league, how much would you spend on him? Derrick Henry is all of it. That's my answer to that. All of it. Yep. Uh, he's going to get this job. He's going to take the starter's job. They have to. There's not this a year. Ch- Yes, it's happening. I think it's happening this week, actually. I think if you go back to the the Colts game in week six, uh, if you looked at that, coming into this week, Murray had totaled 61 carries to Derrick Henry's 58. Not many people realize that, but Henry has already been like in a 50-50 timeshare since week six. And then obviously this week we saw him outperform DeMarco Murray again. DeMarco Murray has been so bad. Like, I, I, I don't I don't need, I don't think we need to harp on that because if, if you watch that Thursday night game with the, the camera angle... I know not everybody can watch every game like we try and do every single week, right? But I, I, I've watched DeMarco Murray. He's been bad. That week, everybody was able to see it with that camera angle. Um, but he, this week, he was pathetic again. It's affecting Marcus Mariota because they're not setting up play action because DeMarco Murray's not getting anything done on the ground. They need to go with Derrick Henry. And I think it happens because this is a team that's still involved in a playoff race for whatever reason. And even, even though their offense has played like complete crap and Derrick Henry needs to get on the field, he's... Honestly, it's very close as to who I would prefer for the rest of the season. I think it's Derrick Henry than DeMarco Murray. Wow. For the rest of the season. Okay. So let's say DeMarco Murray, let's say they hand the job to Derrick Henry tomorrow. 
Where do you put Derrick Henry in your rest of season rankings? I would put, well, they're still going to have DeMarco Murray involved, so it's still going to be somewhat of a timeshare, but let's say it flips okay. where it's like DeMarco Murray is the one on the 40% side and Derrick Henry's getting 60% and that we know that going into every week. I'd put him as, looking at it right now, I'd probably put him as my number 16 running back right in front of Lamar Miller. Ahead of Lamar Miller. So like kind of similar to Jarek McKinnon, definite start every I've single that Joe, Yeah, right in that Joe Mixon, yeah. Samaj yeah. P. Ryan territory. Okay, now let's say DeMarco Murray goes out next week and he gets hurt. Is Derrick Henry top five? He is definitely top eight. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I, and I think that he is top five. I would put him behind. I don't know if I. I don't know if I'd put him behind the Saints running backs. Yeah, I would. I, there's <laughs> Alvin Kamara. That guy is just so ridiculous. He's amazing, isn't he? He's, He's so just fun. incredible. He's so fun to watch. Like, like that's after the first two weeks or whatever. Everyone thought Kareem Hunt was like the next big thing. We had no idea what was coming with Alvin Kamara. I don't remember a rookie running back being this good ever. I um, it's 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 been a while. I mean, Leonard Fournette looked really good to start the year. Kareem Hunt obviously looked good, uh, but Kamara is getting it done in so many different ways, and he fell into the right offense. You know what's funny, Bobby, is yeah. that I I went I typed in something Alvin Kamara the, like this past week, and I was searching for something, and my scouting report popped up that I did this off season on him, and I clicked on it. I was like, what did I say about Kamara? Like you know, because I knew I liked him, and I compared him to Jamal Charles in the article. I, I thought that he was a Jamal Charles type player. That's who he should emulate going to the NFL. That's who he should try and be. Um, not to say he was going to be Jamal Charles, but in my, in like all the players I started uh, recommending the teams that they fall to in the draft, I, I hit that one right in the head. I said, if he goes to the I Saints, remember. he's, he's going to have uh, fantasy relevance right away. And as it turns out, he, he fell to the Saints and he does. Um, it's like the perfect marriage. I felt like that was a team. Like if, if Alvin Kamara was on a different team, he may not have the relevance that he has. He's obviously still yeah. a very good player, but I think he fell in the perfect offense with a perfect skill set. The offensive line is playing out of their minds. He has a quarterback that's respectable that they can't just focus in on stopping Kamara because Drew Brees will beat you too. So it's a perfect marriage. All right, Tags, we're going to get to the lightning round and drops in just a second, but I know you have a Kareem Hunt stat you want to share, so go for it. I do. Uh, since the start of week six, which has like been like a, a, a trend that I've noticed with whatever I'm saying today, since the start of week six, here's a few running backs who have scored more fantasy points than Kareem Hunt. Austin Eckler, Isaiah Crowell, Corey Clement, Adrian <laughs> Peterson, and Matt Forte is just two decimal points behind uh Kareem Hunt. Wow. So that list of running backs does not do much for your Kareem Hunt confidence. And knowing he he fell flat on his face against a, a Bills defense that had allowed 11 rushing touchdowns in three games, I'm officially concerned. And I know that we had Jeff on, and I know that there's a lot of people out there saying that his metrics are still good, that he's still breaking tackles and this and that. But that's the thing. If it's not leading to fantasy points, it's, it doesn't matter. And the, the fact that the Chiefs' offense is falling flat on their face, the fact that their offensive line isn't blocking very well, the fact that they're not stretching the field at all to take any away attention, the, the play calling has been atrocious. All those things have to, you have to take into consideration. And Kareem Hunt just, it's been more than the last couple of weeks. It's been back since the start of week six. It's amazing. You know what? I uh, put an offer out for Kareem Hunt in like week four, week five. I thought I was buying low mm -hmm. um, because I, have a, I had Zeke and I thought, oh, he's going to be suspended. So I need to go get another running back. And it was denied. So I was like, OK, I guess I'll just go get Todd Gurley. I'll tell you what, when that was denied, I had no idea that was saving my season. It did. Uh, it did. I mean, I Kareem Hunt, I own in a, a lot of leagues because I drafted him in like the third, fourth round. Uh, when once we found out that Spencer Ware went down, I wanted the starting running back for the Chiefs. And he was a guy that I was willing to sell for the right price. But nobody ever approached me with enough that I would consider it. I still think that I still think that some people are over exaggerating his demise, like saying that they're not going to start yeah. him because like the either way you slice it, he's still a starting running back that's seeing, you know, more than a dozen carries per game. He has regardless before this week, he had one. He had just one game with fewer than 10 PPR points. So he's been pretty consistent. I mean, he just hasn't had the ceiling that people were expecting over the first three weeks that he had, but he's still been a consistent, you know, RB2 in fantasy football. So, I mean, this one yeah. bad week, it is what it is. It was a major letdown. I am concerned, but at the same time, he's still, you're still starting him in fantasy. He still has more standard league starts than Le'Veon Bell, Mark Ingram, Melvin Gordon, Alvin Kamara, Leonard Fournette. I mean, he's number two for running backs this season in fantasy football. That's crazy. That's crazy. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Cause like at the end of the year, I'll always go through it and find like the consistency that people had uh, in terms of their finishes and whatnot. But I know he's been consistent. I know that for sure. Uh, but Alvin Kamara, he's also been one of the more consistent running backs in all of football. 
All right, Tags, lightning round for drops. Just a yes or no, drop him or not. Uh, Blal Powell. Yes. Yep, drop him. Cameron Brait. Yes. Drop him. Uh, David Johnson, drop him. He is not coming back. Can we put an asterisk by by uh, Cameron Brait where if Jameis Winston, they say if he returns this week, I don't want to drop him? That's fine, but I'm dropping him anyway. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kenyon Drake. Oh, he's a must add. I would spend all of my money to get him. I have him top 20 the rest of the season. Damian Williams is done for the year. Like they're saying that he's going to miss one game, maybe two or three. He's done for the year. He separated his shoulder. He dislocated his shoulder. He's out. When you combine the touches between Drake and Williams over the last couple of weeks, if you can get one running back out of that, you really, really want that running back. And Kenyon Drake is someone who can get it done in the passing game. He can get it done on first and second down. Honestly, I would take him over Jay Ajayi. I'd take him over Amir Abdullah to finish the year. Wow. Uh, he, he's someone that if you have on your roster, you really just lost out i like it man i like that a lot okay what about uh danny woodhead keep and this is by the way this is being recorded um before the monday night game okay randall Cobb. drop yeah i'm dropping him as well uh what about cohen for the for the bears oh, God, i don't even want to talk about the bears uh it, it, <laughs> it it's kind of he's i don't want to say drop because he's the type of running back if if something happened to jordan howard he's like one of those higher upside because the bears do want to run the ball he can contribute in the passing game too but, yeah i mean i would dr- I'd, I'd keep him because of his upside like if he's available right now i'd put him as a top five waiver wire ad yeah i mean that's how i feel about it and that's what i'm saying it depends on who you're dropping him for i'd drop him for someone like maybe like a james carner or charkandrick west but i mean or rod smith but outside of them he's fine yeah yeah buck allen drop mike wallace drop um mike gillisley he's still uh, he's still owned in 33 percent of leagues what are these people doing drop him already do you think that he's going to play this week against his former team? No, I, I don't think he's going to be active, is he? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I, it's funny. I was thinking about that. I'm like, he's playing his former team this week. Is he going to be active? That's that's something that made me wonder a little bit. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, Damian Williams, by the way, you mentioned him. He's a drop. What about Terrell Williams? Now with Mike Williams out, I'm picking him up. I mean, Mike Williams wasn't playing for the first, like, what, eight games of the season, and Tyrell Williams had one game. So it, it's really tough because yeah. if they're if they're going to start going more towards Hunter Henry uh, and playing that way, Keenan Allen is all of a sudden getting tons of targets. And if he's getting tons of targets, I want him on my team. I've said that before, is that Keenan Allen, if he's not getting the targets, he's not producing. But if he gets them... He's going to produce and he's getting, you know, he saw like last two weeks, he's seen 15 and I think 13 targets. So yes, he's going to produce. Okay, Tags, very last one here. Aaron Jones, is he coming back? And even if he is, do you drop him? I drop him at this point. I I, I mean, when, by the time he comes back, this is going to be a three-way timeshare and yeah. they're going to go with the hot hand and you're never going to be able to trust him. Yeah, yep, I'm with you. I'm dropping Aaron Jones as well. Um, and Aaron Rodgers, I, f- I forgot to mention him, but I'm keeping him regardless um, Brent Hundley is, is playing fine football. I think they're going to be in the playoff race and I think Rogers is going to come back. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if they're going to be in the playoff race by that time. It's, it's tough to say, but their schedule over the next couple of weeks does favor that where it's like they could be in and Rogers was seen on Sunday night football and warmups throwing the ball. I think they said 52 yards in the air. I'm like, wow, obviously, you know, I don't know how far along I've never had my collarbone broken. So it's hard for me to say, you know, what the time frame is and like what what holds him back from returning. Is it is a pain tolerance where if he gets hit on that on that injured shoulder, is that going to cause a lot of pain? Is it really touchy right now? But if he's throwing the ball 52 yards, something that's 99 percent of the, the U.S. population cannot yes. do. I mean, how, I don't know how far he is, but you made a compelling case I, before I would have said that. Aaron Rodgers was a drop, but you made a compelling case where it's like, you know, if you can get one game out of a guy like this, that's what we hold these bench stashes for. So why not? So I'm down with it. Yeah, it's uh, it's plus replacement level value. I mean, a lot of these guys you have on your fantasy bench, what are they like plus one replacement level value? Aaron Rodgers, if he plays one game is plus 12. (laughs) <laughs> kind of. Yeah. And it's against Seattle. And some people were like, well, it's against Seattle. It's not a great matchup. The Seattle team is obviously not okay, the same plus 10 Seattle team. <laughs> right. Well, but that's the thing. The Seahawks are, are now a matchup that you can target with your passing game. Like I, that's how yeah. I feel about it. Um, but yeah. All right, Tags. That's all for today's show, man. Looking forward to chatting with you Wednesday about start sit decisions. We're going to make our bold predictions. So get a good one ready. Then we're going to talk DFS later in the week with Matthew Friedman. And I also want to say thanks to the sponsor of today's show, Lisa Mattress. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash fantasy pros for a hundred dollars off your mattress order purchase. Remember, we've got the giveaway going on right now for a free Hall of Fame upgrade for a year at fantasypros.com. All you have to do is subscribe and review us on iTunes, then send us a screenshot at contest at fantasypros.com. 
For Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening and enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.